Nanjing has a long and storied history, stretching way back. And this area was incorporated into China's first great empire, that of the Qin. And then the successor empire, that of the Han, the long-lived Han, the contemporary of the great Roman Empire on the other side of Eurasia. This was part of the Han Empire. For centuries afterwards, it served as the capital of one little Chinese state after another. It was an important metropolis, I and mean, it's very significant. At any given time, we're talking the ancient city, a million people lived here. Celebrated scholars, celebrated poets, celebrated philosophers. Uh, this was a Buddhist center, this was a Taoist center. During the Sui, during the Tang, during the Song, during the, the Yuan Dynasty periods, this remained a significant city. The Ming made Nanjing its capital for a while. In fact, during that period, the famous Zheng He's fleet, one of the great fleets in world history, was built right around here. And the Qing also, which followed the Ming, the Qing made Nanjing a provincial capital. But the worst for the city probably didn't come when it was being fought over by rival ancient Chinese states, as during the Three Kingdoms period, or even with the arrival of the conquering Mongols. But instead, during the long century between the mid-1800s and the mid-1900s. During that time, Nanjing experienced a barrage of violence and bloodshed and suffering and serves perhaps as a microcosm of the great and often destructive change then taking place in China. When the Qing tried to stop British merchants from selling their opium in China, essentially imprisoned a bunch of them and destroyed all their product, which is very bold, the British responded with an invasion. And some of the worst fightings in the last great battle took place just downriver from here in Zhenjiang as the British made their way to Nanjing. In fact, the British would take Nanjing and it was here that the treaty was signed that ended the conflict. The Treaty of Nanjing, which opened up China to an unprecedented level of foreign interference and influence. Uh, so yeah, China had been brought to its knees by foreigners right here in Nanjing. And though this episode receives quite a bit of attention, and perhaps rightly so, it paled in comparison to what would come next. The worst would come from within. Just a few years later, 1853, Nanjing was taken by another force, another outside force, battling the Qing. These guys were the Taipings. They were a millenarian group. This is technically a rebellion since these guys are Chinese. Uh, ardently anti-Qing, seeking to establish a heavenly kingdom of great peace on earth. They're a quasi-Christian group, very interesting group. Most of the Christians of the day would have, you know, refuted them and the, pr the proposition that these guys were Christian, but they saw themselves as Christian. Their leader is the brother of Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, these guys took Nanjing, very, very bloody fashion. The body count of the Taiping Rebellion makes the Opium War look like a, a little meaningless skirmish. I mean, we're talking about the body count of two World War I's in the Taiping Rebellion. And Nanjing was their capital. They made Nanjing their heavenly capital, essentially turning it into a big commune. Now, the Qing tried to win back Nanjing. It was under siege for years afterwards. It never really worked. Ultimately, it was a voluntary army known as the Xiang Army, led by a guy named Zheng Guofan, who arrived here and took the city down in the massive third battle of Nanjing. And this is something like a million soldiers taking part in this one battle. And when it was over, the Taiping were essentially broken. And Zheng Guofan, as many generals do, let his soldiers sort of have their way with the city. So Taiping Rebellion, something like 20 to 30 million dead. So massive, massive destruction and death. And uh, Nanjing city, laid waste. Qing authority was never as strong afterwards, and it took Nanjing decades to recover, or even begin to recover. By the early 20th century, Nanjing had finally begun to become an important trade and communications hub for China again. But there was a general sense of uneasiness in the country, and the Qing seemed unable to stop foreigners from humiliating China at will. And there always seemed to be someone, some group in open rebellion somewhere in China against the Qing. Meanwhile, there were those 
who said that the time had come to push the Manchus out and restore Han rule to China. In fact, the Xinhai Rebellion, which set off that whole chain of events that ultimately brought down the Qing Dynasty, occurred not far from here. Of course, that whole set of events included the death or injury of hundreds of thousands of people. The Han nationalist Sun Yat-sen wanted to make Nanjing his new republic's capital city, and he was successful for a while, but in the end he lost out to Yuan Shikai and Beijing. Well, after his death, and you know all the infighting that took place, and the rise of Chiang Kai-shek and the northern expedition when Chiang Kai-shek you know, unified the Chinese heartland, Chiang made Nanjing the capital of the new republic. So this is in 1928. And for the next 10 years, he spruced it up and the city was modernized. And there was even a mausoleum of Sun Yat-sen built and placed here in Nanjing to buoy up the legitimacy of the, of the regime. And the next 10 years have been dubbed since the Nanjing Decade. Why only a decade? Because the Japanese showed up. And as so often happens during times of war, an already bad regime became out and out murderous. And we're talking about the regime of Chiang Kai-shek here, the Chinese nationalist regime. Millions of Chinese died at the hands of this regime during the war years. Millions by starvation and famine and disease, but also millions probably from Chiang Kai-shek's murderous conscription squads. Not to mention hundreds of thousands and possibly more. These are dissidents who were out and out executed. In 1931, the Japanese had taken Manchuria. And in 1937, they invaded the Chinese heartland itself. And that same year, they took Shanghai, right on the road to Nanjing. For months, they bombed Nanjing. And finally, at the end of the year, they stormed the city. Now, this is often called the Rape of Nanjing. For the next month, Japanese soldiers looted, burned, pillaged, and yes, raped, and killed somewhere in the vicinity of 200 and 300,000 inhabitants of the city, one of the great World War II atrocities. And they tried holding the city for years afterwards using a series of puppet governments, but after all those atrocities, never quite stuck. And after World War II, unfortunately for China, uh, the country languished in a state of civil war, nationalists versus communists, for several years. It wasn't until 1949 that the communists were able to defeat the nationalists. And throughout that time, Nanjing was Chiang Kai-shek's capital. But 1949 is also the year Mao and his communists took it and uh, he made his capital Beijing and proclaimed the People's Republic of China and Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists were run out of the country. The next couple decades under communist rule, time of great suffering throughout China, including in this region. Millions of people in the region died, for example, during the Great Leap Forward, along with tens of millions throughout China from starvation as well as for other reasons. During the Cultural Revolution, much of the city's cultural heritage was destroyed by overzealous Red Guards, as was much of Chinese heritage all over the place, as well as the heritage of other peoples. Today, despite all the death and devastation meted out on Nanjing during that long century between the mid-1800s and the mid-1900s, the city is vibrant. Uh, commerce, culture seem to be thriving, but its future is uncertain. After all, China is still governed by the Chinese Communist Party. This is a party with more Chinese blood on its hands than perhaps any Chinese regime before it.